Uh, so this is just an example of your inventory. Uh, this is a static inventory. Obviously, it's just a text file. Uh, it's in INI format. It talks about uh, web servers at the top. Uh, maybe you're managing web servers or proxy servers as well as database servers. Um, and then below that, it says all DB servers. Uh, perhaps you have um, you know, a whole suite of uh, DB servers there. And then maybe you have some dev servers, too. Um, Ansible actually recommends to have different INI files for different dev, production, et cetera. Um, you can do it either way. It's sort of up to however you do it in your environment. I'm also going to talk at the end a little bit about how you can do this dynamically in something like AWS or Rackspace or other cloud providers. OK, but this is, this is one of the key elements to, um, to using Ansible. Uh, all the hosts that are in your suite or your arsenal are going to be listed in an inventory in one way or another, whether it's static or dynamic. Uh, it has an easy command line interface, like I mentioned. This is just a couple of examples. Um, all the commands that you're going to be running start with either Ansible or Ansible Playbook. Uh, in this case, you're saying, say, Ansible all minus m ping. In that case, you're calling the ping module. Uh, and you're saying, run it against every one of my hosts. Pretty simple. Or perhaps I'm saying, hey, I want to ping all my dev DB servers. Or I want to run a command called you know, echo hello on all my servers. OK, so this is basic stuff. You all raised your hand that you know what Ansible is. Um, this, is kind of how, um, this is kind of how the command line works. Um, the last one, the minus F10, is in parallel. So you can reboot all your uh, prod DB servers in parallel all at once. So that might be a bad thing. Maybe it's a good thing if there's a, an outage or a problem, or maybe you're a, uh, some sort of issue, and you've got to reboot those things right away. OK. So uh, modules, again, are a core construct in, in Ansible. Uh, there, there are core modules, and those are listed on the website. And they do everything from pinging to MySQL to MongoDB to Postgres to altering stock config files to installing YUM packages. There's a module for just about everything you want to do. And it's pretty cool because when you say, hey, I want to go install Perl on these hosts, or I want to go install you know, Python, or whatever it is, there's typically a module that covers those things. Uh, and I'm going to talk in a few seconds about the Postgres-specific ones. Um, there's also Ansible Galaxy. Galaxy is user-contributed modules. So if you would like to build your own module, and I've built a couple, um, you can put them out there, and the rest of the community can, can um, pull those off Git and use those. In fact, you can actually even reference those right on GitHub if you want to run the, the very latest. Um, and so here's an example of one. This one's Postgres Privs. Um, it is basically saying, hey, for the DB library, I want to allow select insert update to the roles librarian and reader with grant. Okay, So that's a really easy way to say, um, to give that, that, that role those permissions. Um, and what's interesting is you saw on the last slide I did minus F10. I did that in parallel. So if you needed to execute this on 20 databases and ensure that this role existed and these privileges existed on 20 databases, it's a one-liner in Ansible. And so that's kind of the core power of Ansible and databases. If you have a bunch of databases and you don't know what exists on those databases and you need to make them all look the same, Ansible's your huckleberry. So like I said before, wrapping up all these commands in playbooks is how you make multiple things happen at one time. Maybe you want to install a package, then you want to edit a config file, and then you want to start a server, and then you want to test a server, something like that. All those commands would be wrapped up in a playbook, and maybe that playbook is called um, you know, Saturday afternoon uh, rush on database.yaml or something. You know, it's, a, it's a thing that you've all seen where um, at the least likely moment that uh, you're out with your wife or, or your husband or whatever, girlfriend, um, and you're having dinner and your database all of a sudden goes down because some client workload went nuts or there's a missing index or the developer pushed some code or whatever it is, and you have that fix in a YAML file that maybe uh, you know, stops the database or alters pghba.conf to block people or whatever your fix is for that. You may wrap that in a playbook, and then it's very easy to rerun that. It's also very easy to communicate that to other staff members. Like, dude, 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 just run the you know, fixit.yaml. Just run it. Well, that'll fix everything kind of thing. So that's the real power. And at the bottom there, you can see how it runs. You call ansible-playbook. You specify your inventory file. And then you just give it a YAML file, and that's the playbook that it's going to run. OK, that's the real quick, went through that super quick, um, Ansible, high-level stuff. So 
how is Ansible and Postgres very powerful together? Um, you don't hear a lot of people talking about using um, Ansible in databases, and I'm not sure why. We use it um, at Rackspace and Object Rocket quite a bit. In fact, all of our database infrastructure is managed by Ansible, uh, especially some of our new products like Elasticsearch. So whether it's um, Postgres or not, we actually implement these standard procedures for all the databases. And that's just so that if we have to tell a new DBA um, how to do something, or even just making sure that all of our changes are checked in, buddy checked, gone through Git, gone through dev, gone through production, so that we know when we're running something via Ansible, it's going to be actually production grade. It's going to do what we expect. So do you need Ansible is the first question I think you should ask. And the answer is probably. If you have more than a few databases, you probably need something like Ansible. Um, a lot of folks have cooked up their own scripts, have cooked up their own procedures over the years. Um, if you have more than one database or you have, you've done something more than once, of course you're going to have that in a SQL file or your shell script or whatever it is that's you know, part of your procedures. But Ansible is pretty cool because Ansible allows you the flexibility to run whatever it is in a common framework that all your team members and all the folks on your staff can understand. So uh, I think it's very powerful to kind of move my um, repository of old school bash scripts and SQL files to something like Ansible so that I have a common framework to describe things to folks. It is good for database provisioning, but as DBAs and DevOps folks, we don't provision often, right? We provision fairly seldom. We, we build a database, we fill it with data, but our primary job is to manage those databases over time, manage the schema, the users, the roles, replication, lag, things like that. So, you know, I find that the thing that Ansible is designed to do and provision and build things, I actually do seldom. Uh, it's more about the database management side that we end up using Ansible for. And I'm gonna talk more about that. And ultimately, that just means DBA sanity. You have a very clean cut way of running jobs, running code, and implementing things against your servers um, that's very predictable and known. So let's talk about idempotency a little bit, because databases aren't necessarily idempotent, right? You can't just rerun something on a database every time. You can't say, um, you know, update a, a row and add one to it. Well, that's Every time you do that, you're actually mutating it, right? You have to say set it equal to five or something like this. So um, that's a consideration as you build scripts and as you build playbooks, is you have to realize that these things can be rerun over and over and over again. So you have to make sure that you're not actually adding relative measures. You have to make sure that you're actually going to construct something that will be idempotent at the end of the day. And databases are more sensitive than other things to that. All right, so let's talk about um, provisioning a little bit. This is, a, this is you know, the basic provisioning of Postgres. Um, and here's how it kind of goes. Um, this is the YAML file. This is a playbook. Um, in this case, there's a group, uh, and it's called PG group, and I want to make sure that is present. So it's going to add that. Then it's going to add a user. This is OS user. Um, then it's going to um, install a YUM package, a couple of YUM packages, and in this case, um, I'm insta installing Pipeline DB. So this morning, I don't know if you guys saw, but there's a Pipeline DB presentation. It's quite good. Um, I'm a fan, and I've been using that. So the, some of these examples are Pipeline DB um, related. Anyway, uh, then you initialize the database. Um, in this case, you, it calls init. Um, and in this, and it's ignoring any errors. Maybe that's what you want. Maybe it's not. Um, and then it's going to do things like alter the pga.conf uh, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, Basic DB setup, um, if you have 100 databases or you're building slaves or replicas, maybe you need to do this more often. Um, but it sure does make it easy if you have a common way to do it every time. If you're like me, you probably have a shell script that has done this. You've done this for a long time. Um, I recommend moving it to Postgres, or I mean to Ansible. OK, and here's what the output looks like. Uh, so I called Ansible playbook minus i host.txt, which is my inventory. We talked about that. And then say setup pipeline.yaml. And what it'll do is it'll say, I'm running this play. It'll go out and gather facts. In this case, it's uh, hitting three different IPs. Um, it's going to go ahead and add the group, blah, 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 blah. Now, what you'll notice is some of them say changed. So that means it did not have the change. It added the group or it added the user. And other ones will say it's OK. It already was there. So that's the idempotent component of it. And at the very bottom, you'll see a recap of what happened. And in this case, uh, the very first IP, I had three things changed. Uh, nothing failed, uh, pretty obvious, okay? So that's kind of how the flow works, pretty simple. 
So the modules for Postgres, um, that there's a few out there. I think you know, part of me doing this talk is to bring awareness. I don't work for Ansible. Um, I don't you know, have a, a, a dog in that hunt, but I do think that Ansible is pretty cool, especially as it relates to databases. And so I've been working on uh, modules myself, and I'd love if other folks helped pitched in. Um, the core modules that are out there are, are ones for creating the database, the user, or AKA roles, um, privs, and uh, a few other things like uh, extension, uh, foreign extensions, uh, like whatever, you know, uh, uh, like, like Citus data extension, things like that, um, and a couple more, but they're relatively minor. So in the grand scheme of things, um, there needs to be a lot more Postgres roles. Um, we could, I, you know, I think, Obviously, uh, setting up replication would be one. Doing backups would be one. There's, there's some obvious ones that are, that are left undone that exist in other database systems like MySQL or MongoDB. Um, the user uh, modules that I talked about, there's uh, Ansible Galaxy, which is, is you know, a, 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 like GitHub for, for modules. And those are user-defined um, roles and user-contributed roles. Um, and I actually contributed the, the pipeline DB one. So, um, you know, basically pretty simple. Okay, so let's talk about operations and how Ansible can, can help ops and, and DBA ops and DevOps. So mostly it is that we either have too many servers, too little time, or too many people to help with the problems, and that leads to mistakes. And so I think that uh, Ansible or tools like Ansible can help uh, reduce those problem sets. So I'm going to show a few examples of that. Um, my advice is uh, to set up a management host or two uh, in the DC where you'll be, ha where you have most of your your database servers co-located. So, if you're using Amazon, do them in Amazon. If you're using your own data center, do them there. Whatever it is, um, set up virtual env in Python and Ansible. That's a typical Python thing. Um, Ansible's written in Python, so you'll probably want to use virtual env. Um, if you use uh, uh, Git, uh, I, I highly recommend using at least some sort of source code uh, repository, but you know, Git's my favorite and GitHub. Um, and the key there is to really make sure that you have your management code, wh whatever that is, if it's SQL scripts or shell scripts or whatever it is, checked in there, version controlled, as part of your you know, day to day operations. Um, because Ansible, and I'm going to show a couple examples of this, is very powerful with, with source code control systems like Git. Um, and then standardize your inventory. So if you have 100 hosts out there, some of them are on Amazon, some of them are in your DC, some of them are, are you know, dev servers or your laptop or whatever they are, make sure your inventory file is also in source control. It's checked in, double checked, et cetera. And then the one prereq we'll need, you'll need to make sure happens is that every one of those hosts is gonna have to have an SSH key on it. Now, maybe you use the root key on everything, maybe you don't use the Postgres keys. However you do your own key infrastructure, um, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to do that, but you want to make sure that you standardize it across the host. That's the thing that Ansible uses to get out to the host to implement, um, to implement the, the YAML files. So it kind of looks like this. This is a real common setup. You'll have a management host, you'll have your inventory file, you'll have different regions, and you'll have prod, dev, staging perhaps, and you'll have them by, by DC or by zone. Okay, and the interesting thing here is that you can span, if you have a hybrid setup where you have a private DC, you have a public cloud, maybe you have some dev servers over in Amazon, maybe you have some, some stuff in Rackspace, wherever it is, make sure your inventory file actually matches that stuff, label those out with the tags that I showed earlier, and then you'll have like really fine-grained control over your entire infrastructure. So you can say, just go to Amazon and you know, add a yum package to all those things, or just upgrade my slaves to 944, or whatever it is. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the things you can do. So obviously, start, stop, init DB, anything with PGCTL, that's gr those are great things to do in Ansible. It's always nice to reach out and say, I want to stop every one of my slaves, or I want to check lag on every one of my slaves. PGHBA.conf is a sore spot with, I think, with a lot of people and has been for a long time. Um, getting it right and making sure that it's standardized, making sure that you're not blocking access where you shouldn't, um, alleviating the pains with like, well, what is wrong with this file? Um, create a, a common and standardized pghba.conf, save it in Git or GitHub, use Ansible to deploy it. There, you're done, it's simple. Um, upgrades is another thing that, that um, Ansible is great for. 
Because you can just go out there and say, all my slaves, upgrade those to 944, say. Um, and I want to see how that's going to bake for a little while. Or maybe User management and schema uniformity are another sore spots. Um, probing every one of your databases to see what the schema looks like and make sure it matches. Uh, maybe, you didn't, maybe there was a code push and you didn't run the SQL to add a column, you know, the DDL, to one particular relation. And, and <clears throat> now it's not indexed or now it doesn't exist. Now you're in trouble. So remember, it's idempotent. So you want to run it. You want to have that thing go out, execute across all your databases, and come back and say, hmm, this thing's different. So let's kind of go through a few one-liners and give you an example of what I'm talking about. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm saying all my US East production servers, I want to ping them. I'm using a host INI parallel to, and it's just going to come back. This is the most simplistic of Ansible one-liners. Um, and I think what you'll find is if you start using Ansible as a DBA or a DevOps person, you'll start to get good at like just pounding these out. You'll be like, OK, show me you know, if every one of my servers is up. OK, show me everything in this zone, blah, 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 blah. And you'll treat uh, whole suites of servers as if they're one. And I think that's where you start to get into the sweet spot with Ansible. You start to think, like, hey, I've got 30 servers out there, but I'm really only issuing really one command to have them all do the same thing. OK, so in this case, I'm becoming the Postgres user, and I'm doing select version. OK? Uh, so come back and, make, and tell me that the version, what the version is on all these servers. So in this case, you know, I want to make sure that I'm, I've got the same version across all my hosts. And, and by the way, that they're up. So if they, weren't, if they weren't up, one of them would say success, RC, some RC code. And you'd say, OK, 10% of my servers are down. OK. A little bit more interesting, but still not fantastic. But what about like make sure the indexes that my application requires are there? So this is a little bit more powerful use case. Um, and remember, idempotency matters. So what you would do is actually issue a create index statement in the background. Right? So you'd say, you know, create index current currently, blah, 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 on my table. And you'd issue that on every database. And the reason you do that is you want to make sure that, boy, I want to make sure they're all the same. They all have that index. So you don't say, you know, tell me what indexes are out there. You say, go make sure these indexes are out there. By the way, this is really cool after a push. So developers write some code. You know the dev system has XYZ index. You know that that has to be out on production. So you can implement that in a YAML file, and you can call it a push script, run it after the code goes live, and you know you'll be in good shape. In this case, what we're doing is, so let's say you have a code push. There's um, your application code version 3, or whatever it is. And let's say you know there's a, a set of DDL that goes with that application push. Uh, my advice is to implement that in Ansible and put that into a Git repo. So have your developers check in that code, and then actually in Ansible, what you say is, I want on all my servers, I want you to check out this code and run it. So in this case, I'm pulling version head out. Maybe that's not your convention, but whatever. And I'm running it against every one of the servers, and I'm saying, look, become Postgres, actually run the v1.5 prod SQL against every one of these hosts to make sure that that exists. And then maybe if you're using like best practice, you verify that. You have a SQL file that verifies that. So make sure this index is there. Make sure these columns are there. Make sure the stored procedure is there and compiles, and it's OK, et cetera. So to take that a little bit further, another thing you can do is let's say you get a call in the middle of the night and it says, hey, something's slow, right? You never, and if you have more than one database, this is a common problem. Like, well, which one is slow? I don't know which database is slow or all of them slow or, or what. But you probably won't get that information. You'll just get you know, some app user saying it's slow. Or maybe your monitoring goes off or whatever. So one of the cool things you can do is just look, I'm going to run uptime and I'm just going to see which one of these servers is having a problem at all. And that can help me narrow down which one to log in and do something further with. OK, so in this case, dot .79 has got a higher load average. So that might lead me in that direction. Now, this is mildly interesting when there's three servers. But when there's 30 or 90 servers, it starts to get really interesting. And maybe you use command line tools like grep or sed on top of this to further parse these. Um, the common question comes up, like, does this stick stuff in a database? Or you know, is there a way to like, record this over time? The answer is not really. Um, Ansible has some tools, um, Ansible Tower and some other things that are available to help with this. For the most part, what I do is I just put them in text files and parse those text files separately. So just a tip. All right, so let's talk a little bit about triage. Um, so let's say you 
like I said, um, have some you know, bad SQL statement or whatever. And let's say we have our own set of scripts that are triage scripts. Uh, in this case, we're selecting the username, that's a typo there, username, waiting, query start, et cetera, from PG stat activity. Um, that might be our like, you know, go-to de facto uh, script for figuring out if something's wrong. And check that into source control and then use Ansible to implement it, okay? So basically what we're, here, what we're doing here is we're saying become Postgres, go ahead and run this script against all my databases and it's gonna actually return the result sets. So before I showed whether it was like it, it worked or it didn't work, here I'm actually starting to um, spool out results. And in this case, we can see that maybe there's some bad query there that can lead us into that into dot .79. We'll log into dot .79, or maybe we just kill it remotely, right? So in Ansible, we can actually address one host. We can say, this is only this one host. I would like you to become user at Postgres, and I'd like you to go ahead and cancel that back end. Okay, so it's another way to, to do that. Like this? It just spools it. It's command line, you got it. And see that minus O? That gives nice, pretty one line output. So that's, a, that's you know, like my best, my uh, de facto um, query for, run, for running that stuff. Um, does that answer your question? Cool. All right, so let's talk about a little bit more advanced stuff. So you know, just to review there, any more questions on that stuff? We're kind of doing one-liners. We're running SQL scripts via one-liner. The power there is that we're running across everything. We're grepping. We're looking at the results. We're trying to narrow things down, logging in, et cetera. So some other use cases that become more interesting is when I am starting to scale out my clusters. Maybe I'm using PG Shard. If I'm doing that, you know, there's been some discussion today with the side of state of folks about PG Shard. Um, and maybe I need to install uh, different versions of PG Shard or, or, or upgrade PG Shard across all my hosts. If I'm sharding, I probably have a lot of hosts anyway. Um, it's also very powerful for backups and cloning and replica creation. So when you create replicas, you're gonna wanna take a snapshot of that, that primary, you're gonna wanna copy that data, you're gonna make sure those hosts are exactly the same. Ansible's great for that. And then performance tuning. And I showed here kind of a very basic example of performance tuning, right? Okay. But ultimately, it just kind of leads to DBA sanity. So I'm not just saying Ansible's your answer, I'm saying organization is your answer, and Ansible does a really good job of that. So Ansible paired with Git and GitHub does a really good job of that. Okay, so my advice. Um, use modules wherever you can. If there are none, make one. So, uh, like I said, uh, a backup module does not exist for Postgres. That would be a great thing to do. Uh, it would be great to just say, call backup across 20 databases. I just want to take a dump of those things, or I want to make sure that the actual proper backup is done. Um, like I said over and over again, Git and GitHub are really powerful when paired with Ansible. Uh, not just for code deployment within your regular app stack, but also within your DBA tool set. So I think that's a nuance that maybe I didn't, wasn't super clear about. Build your DBA tool set, whether they're SQL scripts, shell scripts, whatever they are, build those into, into Ansible by checking them into Git and use Ansible to pull them out of Git and run them. Uh, use the cloud and set up dynamic inventory. So um, when I first talked about inventory, you saw the different tags, um, you know, US East, US West, et cetera. In a cloud environment, those are really dynamic parameters. Your cloud provider kind of owns those items. Um, whether it's Rackspace and implementing it with uh, OpenStack or whether it's uh, AWS, uh, either one of those or, or other providers, uh, those are just the two that come to mind, um, uh, either one of those providers have uh, extensions in Ansible and that's called dynamic inventory. If you're using the cloud, I highly recommend that you use dynamic inventory because that's gonna allow you to say, hey, go out and hit everything in US East. And that's gonna use their API, it's gonna pull back everything in East, and it's not gonna be a static list. So for this talk, I've been talking a lot about the, the inventory, INI, and, I, and a static list. If you're using the cloud, dynamic inventory is the way to go. Okay, I didn't, I'm not gonna go into that in this talk because it's literally like a whole talk. Um, but the, if you just Google for dynamic inventory Ansible, you'll read about how to do it. It's not too terribly difficult, and it's pretty awesome. 
And then use ad hoc Ansible commands and playbooks in unison. So most of the folks, like if you, Ansible Fest is tomorrow. If you guys were to go there, mostly they'll talk about uh, modules and they'll talk about playbooks. But as a DBA, I want to, or, or DevOps folks, I want to kind of stress Ansible as a command line tool is pretty damn powerful. And don't forget that. And use it, those one-liners that I showed you. Use things like that um, in your environments and, and don't feel bad about it. Um, so ad hoc Ansible commands, even if you're just making it up on the fly like I did the cancel backend, do those things. Um, and then playbooks for more standardized processes. Uh, maybe those are rollout. Maybe those are creating indices or indexes after a push. Um, and playbooks are really good for communicating amongst your team members. So if you have five DBAs or three DBAs, having a playbook for each play or problem or thing that you do. So let's say um, my slaves lag at 3 a.m. Well, run the, you know, figure out what the slave lag problem was, YAML file, uh, at 3 a.m. is very important. And so I can't tell you what to do in your environment, but we all have those things. Uh, I can guarantee each, each one and every one of you has your magical SQL scripts that help you out um, when there's a problem. Implement those in Ansible. That'll be very, very powerful for you. And that's it. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and hit me at uh, Twitter or um, uh, you can just email me. And um, then that's the role for Pipeline DB if you're interested in on what those look like. Questions? Yeah. Good question. So you've used Ansible a few times, it sounds like. Uh, so couple I think there's, okay, so let me, let me see if I got the question correct. This is a great question. Um, the question is, you know, how do I debug things when I create a playbook? Let's say I have 10 steps and the third one goes wrong or I don't, it did something I don't understand or, or, or know what it did. But the playbook says okay. Got it, and okay. Yes, okay, it's a fair question. So. It's a great question. So there's two things. Well, there's really three. The first thing is, as soon as a step fails, it's supposed to actually remove that host um, from any further action. So if it tries to yum install something and it doesn't work, it's not supposed to try to do anything further. It's supposed to. But this is in the bringing up level. I think that's why. In the, in the what level? This is bringing up the instance of running to you, for example. You mean actually provisioning a host on EC2? That's a question for the EC2 folks. <laughs> um, have you tried it on Rackspace? No, I'm sorry, that's terrible. Uh, anyway, I don't know. I don't know about how. I don't know about um, EC2 failures specifically, but the way Ansible. It, but it's a really good question about how do you know that something actually worked. And this is a really good point. So, you know, getting feedback from Ansible, how does that work? Well, there's a couple of facilities there. Um, and it may or may not give you everything you need, but yeah. it's worth discussing. First of all, if you're using an API for dynamic inventory, there's a delineation between that actual inventory and the things you're doing in Postgres, right? right. So if you ask, um, it, I think it uses Bo2 under, underneath to hit the, the, the AWS API. If it does that, those underpinnings may, and by the way, on the rack space, it hits Nova API. So if it's hitting those APIs and not bringing back the right information, you may have like a ghost or orphan server. My suggestion there is to ping them. I showed that script. My suggestion is to maybe write a shell script that validates what you think is there is there and execute that. So like, tell me, the re tell me it's really the way I want it to be. The Ansible is not gonna, the Ansible folks aren't gonna, they're gonna tell you it's not supposed to work that way. I'm gonna tell you, you probably should do that just to be safe. Um, so that's, that's one part. The other part is Ansible does return a fax object. And you can actually go out there and probe for the facts. Um, 
Now, the facts are very much OS level. It doesn't, like if you say, hey, go set up Postgres and, and have the Postgres module return facts, it's not gonna give you every possible fact. It's not gonna tell you like the Postgres version, for instance. You have to do that yourself. So I think, I think my, you know, the long or the short answer is that um, I'd write some sanity scripts that actually decide that what you think happened happened and run those to convince yourself that you're in good shape. Um, and then the other thing would be maybe to look at the facts um, that come back from, from Ansible and see if those are actually appropriate. And lastly, if there's an issue, you know, provisioning servers on something like uh, a dynamic, uh, like a cloud provider like Amazon or Rackspace, um, you know, just mentally have a difference between provisioning in Ansible using those APIs um, than Ansible itself. So maybe what you do, like using Rackspace Nova, you actually issue a Nova command to make sure that that's, that's true or not and figure out what level of the API maybe it's failing at. Um, so that's just... Yeah. Fair. Fair enough. So just to be clear, Ansible is traditionally known as a provisioning tool. So if you, know, if, you go out, if you go out in the community and you start talking about Ansible, they're going to say, yeah, I use it to provision my servers. That's what most people will say. Um, they provision some web servers. Or they, you know, they set up Vagrant and, and, and you know, run some, some containers or something. It's a very common use case. What I'm saying is that Ansible is also good for managing database stuff, especially when you have more than one server. Um, what it's not good at is um, if there is a fire right now, right here and now, and you know you've narrowed it down to what the server is, there's a point in which you stop using Ansible and you start just logging in and using that server directly. Um, I, I can't tell you where that point is, but in my mind, it's sort of like once you've kind of narrowed down the server or servers that are in your problem set when there's a problem of some sort, um, do your normal DBA thing, right? Like get in there and figure out what's going on. Is there, you know, maybe you're, you've, you've got bad disks, the disk rebuilding, there's a vacuum running or whatever it is. Um, you know, that's the point in which you kind of, okay, Ansible, thank you for getting me to this point, and now I'm gonna go ahead and just pick up with my normal, you know, DBA activities. So, does that answer your question? Well, there's, there's, three, there's two or three different peers of Ansible out there. Um, and I think, from my opinion, um, Ansible is the most human-readable format. It's not running code. So that's a, very, it's a plus on its side. Um, and, and that's kind of how I compare and contrast. Like, I'd say that Ansible's kind of, and also it's written in Python. So for me personally, I like that. Um, but that may not be your, your, you know, your cup of tea. So, Igor? So what would be what would disappear and come back? Yeah, like the instance in the cloud may disappear, right? It be replaced any moment. At least in AWS, I'm not sure how it works with Rackspace. But in AWS, the instance may die and be replaced by others. Well, so let's so let's kind of let's kind of go through that. So in let's take the Rackspace use case. So I go out and I provision a server using dynamic inventory. I'm going to get back an IP. That's my IP. Maybe it's a slave. Maybe it's a primary, whatever it is. But I'm counting on that thing to work. It's probably in a container, or it's probably, you know, virtualized in some way, shape, or form. But that's a database. It's persistent. I, I need that data. So, um, you know, I, it depends whether you're using ephemeral instances or what. But if you're using a standard, normal, you know, cloud node, you should be able to count on that IP. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, like in Amazon, it, there are ephemeral nodes, so if they shut down and they come back, your, your data's gone. So I think, you know, in that case, you want to make sure that you have a, uh, you choose the right type of instance. Yeah, I don't have my storage attached to new instance, but this new instance will have new IP. So you do a couple things there. One is you could set up load balancer, right, and give your own DNS names to those things, and then use DNS inside your inventory. Uh, that's a common way to do it. Um, you know, it just depends on what your naming convention is. And I think, just to be clear, those problems exist whether you're using Ansible or not. Ansible is just automating. So I think in, in this case, 
I, I put IPs in my inventory file, which may have been misleading. So maybe what you want to use is DNS names in that case. So that, that's a fair point. Uh, not as much, <laughs> to be honest. Um, we, so I wasn't my decision to start using Ansible, but once we started using Ansible, um, we kind of went whole hog. And so, um, and frankly, we don't, we don't do, uh, you know, Rackspace ourselves, we have a database as a service for Mongo and Elasticsearch and Redis, and all those things are, for the most part, implemented in Ansible. Postgres, we don't have a service for, actually. And so it's something that, as I talk to folks, you know, they can actually use Ansible in a similar way that we do internally, and that's kind of been the, the progression. So that's kind of how we got from say, there to here, to be fair. Um, I think any one of the, whatever, myriad of nine or 10 options now that are out there, I said three before, but there's more now. Um, the attributes that I, I think are important, just kind of going through this journey, is number one, if whatever you're executing is readable by most of your staff in an easy way, that's a very important thing. And I know it sounds trivial, like, well, of course they should understand C. It doesn't always work that way, right? Errors can, errors can happen and, and, and folks can miss stuff. So I think in a DBA team environment, it's very nice to have a YAML file that's using modules in a very clear and concise way. And I think that's kind of the power of Ansible. If other systems have a similar construct, then I'd say that's a positive thing for them too. So hopefully that helps a little bit. This is a good question. So, um, and I, I didn't want to go into it too deep because it gets complicated quick. But um, let's just go right. I'm going to go back to a slide here that might help. Okay. So this is a this is a template. So playbooks are templates, and you'll see the um, the double curly brackets. That's a Jinja two templating paradigm. That's what Ansible imp implements. Um, so you can put an uh, Jinja style variable in anything, including a file template. So the way that I typically do pghba.conf is I will check it into Git with variables. Okay, so it'll look just like that. It'll be named .j2 or whatever, and Ansible will actually move it out to every one of the hosts and replace those variables at you know, runtime. So to me, that's the easiest way to actually use Ansible and pghba.conf together. Um, is, is to have it in Git so that you know, like, there's, what happened on Thursday? Well, we put a new version of the file into Git and we pushed it everywhere and now the reporting user can't get in there. Okay, we'll go back and run the old one or whatever it is. Um, like, like me, you've probably been bitten by misconfiguring or screwing up pghba.conf at least once. Um, and so, you know, Ansible makes that real easy because you can just say on every host, make it equal to, you know, whatever version in Git. And I think that's a, that's a really important key takeaway. In this case, um, what I would look for is the Jinja 2 template and um, the file module. I don't have an actual, uh, I do, right there. See where it says template source equals pipeline conf.j2? You would have a similar one called like pghba.conf.j2. And you can see there, like pg prefix would be the data deer slash PipelineDB.conf. See how it kind of copies it out to a different name? That last line where it says template. And assigns an owner in a group. PGAHB.conf works just the same way. Does that make sense? If not, see me afterwards and I can show you a concrete example. Anybody else? Correct. Oh, well, it depends on how you launch it. Um, if you go way back, that bottom line, minus F10, that sends them all out in parallel, non-blocking. They all come back when they're done. I don't remember. I don't remember. I think if you wanted to do them sequentially, you'd, just not, you'd omit that option, and it would just one, two, three, four. Okay, thanks guys, I really appreciate it.